Do Python for loops make your mind go all loopy? Well, they won't after watching this video. Hi, my name's Nick, and I teach data science here and over on my website at datag.io. Today, we're going to talk about for loops. If you're new here, be sure to hit the subscribe button and click the little bell icon beside it to be notified of when I release new videos just like this one. I have a full written tutorial if you prefer to read along over at my website, and I'll include the link right down below. Let's quickly talk about why you want to use for loops. Coding allows you to automate repetitive tasks, and for loops lets you take this one step further by looping over these repetitions in a meaningful way. Think of a for loop as executing an action for every single item in a list. Let's see how you can write one. Okay, let's start talking about how to write Python for loops. I have the general syntax up on the screen right now, and it reads for item in sequence, and then on a new line that's indented, an expression. Let's break this down a little bit. An item can be any item within a sequence or an iterable object, such as a list. And the expression is any expression that you want to happen within it. The expression can occur on the actual item, or it can just print out a new statement. It can really be anything that you want. And we'll learn later that you can also include conditional statements within these expressions to really take your for loops to a whole other level. Okay, let's actually start coding a little bit here. So I pulled up a Jupyter notebook here and we can begin by importing pandas. So to start off, I have a list here called list five, which contains the items one through five. And we'll want to print out using a for loop later on each of these items, but we'll start off by doing this without a for loop to see how much time for loops can actually save you. So to print these out, we'll need to access each item using its index position. The first item here would have an index position of zero, the second one would have one of one, and so on. So to print each item out, we would simply have to write print list five index zero. And then I'm going to copy this down four more times and just change the index a little bit. And when we print this, we can see that we've printed the items one through five. Now, this was okay because we only had five items in our list, but imagine if we had 25, 100, or even 1,000. Doing it this way would take a really, really long time, and this is where for loops become really important in terms of actually saving us time. So to write this as a for loop, we could write for number in list five, print number. So when we run this now, we get the exact same result as we did before. The syntax here is a little awkward for people that might not be totally familiar with it. This word here, number, could really be anything as long as we use it throughout the actual for loop again as well. What it's saying is for each item within our iterable list five, complete this expression. So if we wanted to call this, say, potato, we could simply throw in the word potato here as well. And now when we run this, we see that we get the exact same result. Now, because Python strives for readability, it's helpful to actually call it something relatable to what's actually contained within the object that you're iterating over. So in this case, it made more sense to call it number rather than potato, um, but it's really up to you, but it does help to guide your future readers in terms of what you're actually trying to accomplish with your code. Sometimes you may want to use for loops simply to complete an action a set number of times without actually needing to iterate over items within a list, and this is where the range function becomes really helpful. Before we actually take a look at how to use the range function with for loops, let's just make sure that we have a solid understanding of what the range function actually is. So the way the range function is written is it, it takes it starts off by simply writing range, and then you have a starting position which defaults to zero. So if you always want to start at zero, you can leave it blank. In this case, we'll specify it. And we want it to go up to 10. Now, it won't actually include the number 10, but it will go up to it. And then there's an optional step here as well to indicate at what step you want to increment your range function. So by default, this goes up by one, but if you wanted to increase the values by any other number, you could include that here. We'll just include one here. So let's assign this to a new variable called range one. 
If we were to print out range 1, it would simply return range 0 to 10. But we could turn this into a list as well by using the list function just to really unpack what's contained within that range object. So what the list function does is it just takes that entire uh, container and turns it into a list item. So now when we print this out, we get the, zero, the numbers from 0 through 9. And so combining this with for loops means that we don't have to create objects that contain, say, 5 or 25 or 100 different items, but we can use the range function to, identify, uh, to tell Python to iterate over this range however many times we want. So for example, if we wanted to just print a statement five times, we could do this really easily using the range function. So if we, for example, set up our for loop to say for item in range five, remember the first argument there is optional and it defaults to zero. We can then write print hi there. So what's going to happen now is that this is going to create a range object, as we saw before, which contains the values from 0 through 4. So when we print this out now, we get a hi there printed five times. One of the really cool things about Python strings is that they themselves are actually iterable objects. So say we have a string, and we'll just call it data g and we wanted to do something to each of the letters or just simply return each of the letters on their own, we could write a for loop to do just that. So we could write for letter and string print letter. So when we run this now, it's actually going to print on separate lines each of the letters within this. One of the other things you might want to do with a Python for loop is add conditions to it. So say you had a list of the numbers from 0 through 10 and you only wanted to include in another list, all of the even values. So we could do this. Let's first create a list. And we'll start an empty list here. So we'll call this list two. And we'll just initiate an empty list. To check whether or not an item is even in Python, you can use the modulo operator to get the remainder of any division by two. Any number divided by two that's even will have a remainder of zero, and any odd number will have a remainder of one. So that's what we'll have our for loop do here. So we'll write for number in list one, if number modulo two is equal to zero, append that number to list two. So we can see whether or not this worked by printing out list two, and we should only see the, the even numbers within that list. So let's break this down a little bit. So we're familiar with the opening statement here. So what this is going to do is it's going to go through each number within list one, which contains the values from zero through 10. The first expression it's going to take on is this if statement. So here it's checking if the number modulo two is equal to zero. So if that number is even, complete this statement here. And this statement really just takes the number and appends it to list two. You can also nest for loops within one another. And this is really helpful if you need to unpack nested lists. So say we have a nested list, which we'll call nested list. And so if we wanted to get each of these items here, we would need to access multiple indices. So what I mean by that is that if we simply wanted to get the first item and type this, it would only return the first item, which is this first list here. So if we wanted to get at the word hi, we would technically actually need to chain these indices together. So we wanted to return the first item of the first item, which we can do by printing this out. So if we wanted to turn this into a flattened list, we could use a nested for loop. To do this, let's first instantiate a new list, which we'll call new list. And we'll just leave it empty. And to write our nested for loop, we're going to indent our first statement with another for loop. So we'll write for nested list item in nested list for item in nested list item new list dot append item. So when we print out our list new list now, we can see that we actually have 
the four items which were previously in two separate lists joined into a single list item here. Another really important item to know about Python for loops is the else statement. The else statement executes when the entire for loop has run out of items or a condition causes the for loop to break. So say we have a list of numbers, which we'll just call numbers, and it will contain the numbers one through three. If we wanted to write a for loop, which printed out all of these numbers, and then at the end of that, simply printed out end of list, we could do this using the else statement. So we'll write for number and numbers, print number, and now on an unindented line, we'll write else, print, no more numbers. So what this is going to do is it's going to run this portion of the for loop first and print each number within the list numbers. After that, it's going to execute this else statement and print no more numbers. So when we run this, we can see that it printed one, two, three, and then no more numbers. A really helpful tool with Python for loops is the break statement. The break statement causes a for loop to, well, break. And this can be really helpful if you're iterating over an item and you really want that for loop to end at a particular point, say at a person's name. Let's dive into how to do this. So we'll have a list of names and say we want this for loop to print out every single name within the list until the name Mel is reached. We can do this by writing for name and names. If name equals Mel break and then outdump this one step and say print name. So what this for loop is actually doing is, is it's going to iterate over each name within the list name, similar to before, and it's going to check whether or not this condition here is true. So for the first name, it's going to check whether or not the name Jane is equal to Mel. Since it's not, it's going to move to this next statement and print that name. After that, it's going to move on to the next item, Nick. And again, Nick isn't equal to Mel, so it's going to move on to this one. Finally, it gets to the third item where this condition actually becomes true, and that's where this break statement comes into play. The break statement causes the entire for loop simply to stop. So it doesn't move on to this statement here, and Mel and John aren't printed. So let's make sure that actually works as expected. So as we can see here, only Jane and Nick were printed out. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you learned a lot today. If you want to learn about an alternative to for loops, check out my video about list comprehensions, which I'll link to right up here. I really hope you enjoyed the tutorial. If you did, be sure to hit that like button. And if you want to be notified of new videos just like this one, subscribe and hit the little bell icon beside it to be notified. Remember, I have a full text-based tutorial over on my website, and I link to it down below in the description if you want to follow along in a written tutorial as well. If you have any questions, be sure to leave them in the comments and I'll be happy to answer them. If you want to follow me on social media, I'm on Twitter at datagio. Thanks so much for watching and have a great day.